Yeah, it's like the older stuff. Absolutely. Well, it's you know, it's it's getting that mix between the newer stuff and the older stuff. But as far as I'm aware, I believe we are live. So, hello everyone. Welcome to Chargehead's live stream. Uh, I've got Paul Compton joining me today, talking all about EV conversions. So, just a brief summary. Every Thursday, eight o'clock. It's Charge Heads Live, and we're talking all about modified EVs, EV conversions. It's going to be batteries next week with uh, Ewan McTurk, so really excited subject. Um, so we've also got this Saturday morning, it's a EV meet at Caffeine Machine in Bedfordshire. So come on down, make sure you get a ticket prior. And uh, yeah, just to give a brief summary of Paul, Paul Compton. Now, I've got a really good um, video where I went to go and see Paul and all his wonderful uh uh builds going on and a nice summary of where paul fits in nicely to the ev conversion market but essentially paul has been doing ev conversion since the mid 90s he's done uh reliant kitten he's very famous for his volkswagen scirocco which was was it the first car to go over 100 miles an hour ev conversion I, i've claimed it was the first road legal ev conversion that would do over 100 and nobody has disputed that fact so there we go there we go people and so that is you know it's great to have paul on the channel because he is very much uh part of the ev conversion uh, community which uh, resides a lot on the open inverter board which i don't so much hi everyone on the uh, comments um I don't tend to go on there so much because I am not technical. So I am the non-technical person of the chat. We have Paul to help us with this. So what I wanted to do with this chat is I wanted to talk about what cars are good for conversion. Now, I've got quite a few in my mind of where I thought, do you know what? Even today, I saw a 19, late 1980s Corvette and I looked at it, I was thinking, you know, Reminiscing of the A-team days, you know, me pretending to be Face or Murdoch, depending on what day it was, and thinking a Corvette would be a cool conversion. But I'm relying on Paul, and Paul made a really good point to me the other day, and I'll start it off with this car. Now, I thought, in my very untechnical way, and that's why I've got a TV on all sorts of fun and games with that, check out the conversion, Tesla powered, is a... Bentley Turbo R would be a wonderful car to do. If they're cheap, they've got loads of space for batteries because on an EV conversion, you need space for batteries, something that my EV TVR conversion has not got. And then Paul completely sport my dreams. Paul, take it away. It's simply the complexity of their hydraulic suspension steering and braking system, which is actually one of the reasons those cars are so cheap is because every time you fix a fault with the mineral oil system, it springs a new one. There we go. On I didn't hand, know that at all. <laughs> in terms of, make, of making a car more reliable and ending up with a really nice car, it'd be a lovely car to do, but it's big and heavy, and therefore you're going to be spending more on a bigger motor and a larger battery pack. Yeah. yeah Having said point. that, one of my old... Friends from the racing days in the, the late 90s, um, Ottmar Ebenhoch, who developed all the Godzilla drag racing controllers. Yeah, a very, um, very famous uh, motor control, if people have not heard of uh, that before. Um, he helped um, convert the ex-Johnny Cash Rolls-Royce. There we go. There we go. And I bet I'm that was an amazing my colourful hat off because it's shading my eyes, so... You, you beat me to it, Paul. I was just about to say that hat, very colourful, very apt for this time uh, that we live in. Uh, but let's move swiftly to the Seat Toledo. Now, there's someone, and I think I might know who this is. Uh, it's just but Seat Toledo. Now, there are many Seat Toledos, but let's take it on the concept, Paul, that someone is looking to convert a golf-type vehicle, front-wheel drive. How easy would it be to convert a car like that? What motor would we recommend what battery pack what what would you do with something like well, that well the the very obvious answer on that is go and buy a crashed e-golf ah okay and you know, uh, don't, we... don't overthink these things sometimes it's just you know they didn't do a, an electric toledo but they did do an electric golf so yeah well weld a boot on the back there we go so, uh, 
<laughs> that would work. It'd probably be a lot less expensive than converting a Toledo, actually. Um, so, so there we go. Just to say hello to everyone in the comments. Thank you. Happy New Year. Um, we've got another, before we roll on to my next one, we'll, we'll start with the comments. David, always thought of Citroen DS. Comfort, that's, hydro, that's hydraulics, isn't it? Um, um, if it's a full DS, it's hydraulic everything. Yeah. That's Including right. Including a semi-automatic gearbox. And of course, Electrogenic have done a DS, haven't they? I'm not sure how they there did have, it. There have been a few. Um, mm. A good resource that's been around for decades um, is the EV album. Yes. It, 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 it's from the days of the electric vehicle discussion list, which is an old fashioned steam powered email distribution list. And it, st it still exists. I'm still on it. There's not a lot of traffic these these days but it's it's still around and the ev album kind of the underground the ev conversion community i see paul uh <laughs> well i mean give, given that i was using that facility um and email in early 90s i mean i i had e access to email at work from 1988 I was only seven, Paul. So it's bragging rights that you were you were online quicker than everybody else. But going back to um, yeah, so as you can see, Paul's been doing it for many many years. So it's great to have him on for this discussion. If the Renault Five is coming back in EV, why not update its arch rival, the Citroen AX GTI? Well, that's part of the um, uh, PSA group, which is oh, Stellantis, isn't it? It, it is now, yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure I doubt they'll do anything with the Citroen AX. It's it's an interesting comment, but I don't think it will uh, go well, anywhere. Of course, but... the Renault Five, there was a production EV version of that, not by Renault, but there was okay. the electric Leopard, where they were That's getting brand cool, new rolling um, shells from um, from Renault, and they were converted to EV. You know, this is this is old school tech with a a brushed DC motor um, and a 96 volt system. Okay. And because uh, in America, where it was known as the uh, Le Car, because American Car. cars with numbers unless they're Porsches, everything has to have a name. Same with the Miata, they, but they wouldn't accept MX5 as a, as a vehicle name. Well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because there's been a couple of cars that we've spoken about in the past and you've highlighted, oh, actually, there was an electric version of that already. And a car that I've been thinking of because so many times I think, OK, the TVR that I've done, there's been a lot of issues. We've had to do the motor on a prop shaft onto the rear diff. OK, ideally, you would have put the motor uh, where the rear diff was. Even better to have a car like a... A Porsche or a Beetle where the engine's in the back so you can because in my mind rear wheel drive is the better car to convert uh, to convert and I'll, I'll come on to your point in a minute because I know that we spoke about this a minute ago however I was thinking okay what and I've been really into American cars recently because American cars are traditionally very very uh, uh, fuel hungry and they've got such a classic design so I went through a load of American cars and I found the core there now, not many people might know the Corvair, and as Paul is talking about this, I'm going to find a picture. But the Corvair is essentially a rear-engined car, quite a, again classic design. I thought, you know what, that would be a, the perfect car. But then Paul says to me, there was originally an electric Corvair, wasn't there? Uh, there was General Motors built the Electrovair, which was silver zinc batteries from the space program. And it was an AC drive system. So in many ways, it foreshadowed the EV1. The EV1? What was the EV1? The General Motors EV1. We're gonna have, we'll have to find that in a second. Hang on, oh, bear with. The, the EV1, is there, there's a whole film about it, who killed the electric car. Because GM ended up taking them all back and crushing them. It's a bit like the Chrysler turbine car all over again. It, I do remember you talking about this before. Hang on, uh, Corvair, we'll come up with it in a second. So the Corvair looks like this. So it is a, I mean, look at that. 
it was really, really, it had a really bad reputation, didn't it, Paul, for the rear end overtaking it, the front end? It's got a similar handling characteristic to a swing axle beetle with the weight hung in the tail and a rear suspension design that wasn't the best for having an engine hung in the tail like a beetle or an early 911. Um, and they, they did sort of put a different rear suspension like they did on the beetle. Mm. Um, rear engine cars are just about the easiest thing to convert as john did his beetle yeah oh one second what was the other car that you just mentioned paul before that gm uh, the electric leopard no 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 uh, when i mentioned the call there the car that uh killed the electric uh the general motors ev1 there we go yeah, i couldn't remember what this looked like Oh, there we go. What a space age, yeah, space age thing that is. Interesting. You know what? You I don't see one of the. Um, I, I think I, I drove one in um, ninety six or ninety seven. Not sure nice. if it was a production one or one of the the pre production ones, but yeah, I'm sure we've never seen. I don't think anyone's got any in the UK. But... No, no, they there is precisely one car in private hands um which was owned by francis well they were only available to lease with no option to buy uh because the batches are so expensive i'm guessing no they just didn't want to sell them at all oh three year non-renewable lease yeah and at the and francis ford coppola had one okay. that he had on his estate and he just wouldn't give it back. And GM just decided the publicity would be too bad if they sent the law in to get it back. And they gave a, they stripped the drive system out of a few cars and gave them to museums. And it's, it's weird. What's the car that's at the um, the Coventry Museum, uh, which is an old school electric vehicle uh, for the UK market? It looks like it's made out of plastic. Um, a Corbin Sparrow? No. Anyway, we digress. Let's get back onto EV conversions. Otherwise, we'll go down a rabbit hole. I knew I knew this was going to happen. Um, so, yes, the Corvair was a vehicle that I was considering. And you said, oh, there was already an electric version. Um, they do an estate version, which I thought would be quite good. And there's and loads got of space. Yeah. And it, there's loads of space. But what I keep coming up against, and I think what's really good about the uh, my EV conversion on the TVR is it just shows all the ways with what makes an EV conversion that much harder uh, to convert space. It's preferable TVR. not to have to restore a car first. This is this is true, but also the fact that space for batteries. Also, you've got Enfield eight thousand. Yeah, I think that's the right one actually. Uh, but yeah, space for the batteries. Also, where the motor goes and making sure. And the UK, it's more specific to the UK than it is for the US is the fact that you can't start chopping the chassis up. You can't modify the chassis. Uh, so you, you can, but you'll get yourself into a whole load of extra expense yeah. and trouble. IVA test, £3,000 per back. No, £6,000 per battery pack, isn't it's, it? It's cheaper now because I think they've sort of backed off from some of the more extreme requirements. Okay. Um, is that quite a recent thing? At one stage, you had to do destructive testing of battery boxes, literally building yeah. fires underneath them. Yeah. That's not required. Um, I mean, talking to Moggy, they they build their cars to ECE 100A, yeah. which is the hybrid uh, and electric vehicle standard that's required as part of the IVA, the individual vehicle approval, if you have to go down that route. But they don't have, um, they don't actually have to formally test it. They just build it to that standard. And that's something yeah. I, gen I generally ag agree with. A lot of people are missing out on a lot of important safety features. Yeah. Um, like battery isolation detection. You know, if you're running, you know, up to, up to 72 volts. I think the standard is 75 peak voltage is considered intrinsically safe that you can get a direct jolt from that. And it, it is not, the shock is not hazardous to your health, 
the injury you might get leaping back. That's often when people get electrocuted, they fall off ladders. And it's the falling right. off the ladder that did them the harm rather than the, the shot directly. But onto you know, a sharp, sharp tool behind you, you'd like, you know, impale yourself on or something like that. Or, or yes, yeah, stepping off an access platform when you're 40 feet up, you know, that. So, yeah, no, so something that always sticks in my mind is when uh, Ralph talks about the twin track uh, acceleration throttle. You know, making sure you've got the backup because you don't want it to be permanently live. You don't want to be, you know, the car just literally whiz off and you've got no control over it. But going back to the EV conversions and away from safety for a second, and I'm sure we'll touch on that in a second. But CMC, I think that's Callum. Um, I'm sick and I like Super Legacy Outbacks. You know, we're all, we've we've got this car sickness. We've all got it. Me and Paul included. Um, wagons up 2009. Terrible road tax. You're absolutely right. Four-wheel drive petrol, they're awful. How would all-wheel drive work with an EV conversion? Now, as my understanding goes, my limited understanding is you just power the drive shaft into the, uh, was it the center box? The um, it, all, oh. it all depends on how you're going to do it. Are you going to put a motor on the original gearbox? Yeah. That's the simple solution to keeping four-wheel drive. Mm. For certain vehicles like the Land Rovers and Range Rovers, they're using a front wheel drive or transverse rear wheel drive, you know, Tesla rear motor yeah. mounted in the middle with the gear ratios changed and the front and rear drive shafts coming out of what were effectively um, the left and right drive shaft out of the differential. Ah, right. OK. And then putting a limited slip diff in so that you don't end up spinning one of your four wheels if you lose traction. Um, as far as road tax, it's not going to help. No. Because it's anything, a... Go on. Is there anything 2001 and up? Goes 2001, by... 2017, I believe. It's anything where the road tax is based on the CO2 rating. Yeah. The CO2 rating the DVLA are claiming cannot be changed. Hmm. And I think when I think about what I know now about EV conversions compared to what I knew when I, you know, went both 12, you know, size 12s in to the TVR conversion is, you know, how I would do it differently. And the fact that, you know, I would think probably I would have probably done a different car knowing the trials and tribulations. However, I do see a positive, the fact that I'm doing the TVR because I do want it to do, I really wanted to do a TVR, but there are all these things that um, it's, it's great to be aware of them before you take the plunge. Cause, and I think it's a good time to go on about cost. Cause we were talking about it before we went live is the fact that, you know, EV conversions are not cheap. However, there are people out there who have got the know-how and as long as they're doing it in a safe way, which is, you know, something that I must reiterate, you know, EV conversions, you need to make sure you're doing it in safe, in, you know, safe location. You're doing it with the right tools, with the right know-how. But I mean, the example of Jamie, um, what was his channel? Jamie... I can't remember what his channel uh, is called. I'll give it out uh, a second, but the vehicle is, that... is the bug plug, which you must be very careful saying. Yes, and he converted his beetle, and it was a newer shape beetle, wasn't it? It wasn't the old. Yeah, I think it is shape. a two thousand and one. There we go, and he did he and converted he, it to he like two and a half thing. grand. Uh, yeah, um, and it, I mean, initially it had only about a thirty-five mile range, mm. but as the van manufacturers are doing they're building vans with 60 mile ranges yeah because perhaps all the delivery companies actually need they don't want to be paying for a bigger battery pack than they actually use doing their delivery rounds so i know he's ex put extra packs in and exchanged the range but initially it was about something he could you know go shopping run the kids to school um and um you know so it was a mitsubishi outlet front motor there it is or 2003 so Still fairly early. So, sorry, what, what motor did he use? Say again. One of the front motors from a Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid. Yeah. There are two motors that are basically the same. One's used as a generator. The other's used as a hybrid drive motor on the front. 
um, and there's the um, the rear wheels are driven by their own motor and gearbox, which is actually basically that from the Mitsubishi Imev Citroen C0 or Peugeot Ion. Yes, and they're getting cheaper. I mean, I've been I've been monitoring the used car market, EV market under 20 grand. I've, I've been all over it. So if anyone's got any questions about EV costs, I could probably do it like that. I even looked at the uh, BCA auctions recently and spotted some really interesting cheap Teslas out there. You know, short ranges, Model 3 starting from 15, then you'd plus your fees. And they were like grade two, grade three and uh, long ranges. These were all under 80,000 miles. Long range started from 17. So EV prices are coming down. And with that, the older Myevs and the cars that we were just talking about there, which are great for EV conversions, you're talking sort of two and a half grand, which is which is great because it has everything there to go, hasn't it? Other than, you yeah. know, obviously the I mean, one, one of the secrets, if you're trying to do it on a budget, um, is that the plug-in hybrid battery packs are the, are the ones to go for. Mm. Um, the I'm addicted to more power density, right? Well, they're, they're still 360 volt nominal, apart from the Mitsubishi yep. stuff, which I think is 288. Um, so post 2019 BMWs are all the full 360 volt that's sort of standard um, for most EVs, Tesla's included until the, the more recent stuff, which I think has gone higher. Yeah. Um, they're, they're very powerful packs because um, it's an 85 kilowatt drive system in the 330 and 530E. And what's the kilowatt hour size? What's the actual battery size? So the kilowatt for people who don't know, that's the, the power, what it can produce, like the brake horsepower torque. Um, and the kilowatt hour is the battery size. So do you know what the battery size is with that, Paul? The, it... the BMW one is 12 kilowatt hours. Right, okay. But once you, I mean, it's basically got this giant um, aluminium casting that looks like a saddle tank and fits in where um un under the rear seat mm. um if you actually open it up probably 50 percent of the volume inside is just dead space but only open it up if you've got the right tools and you know what you're doing just to add they are a relatively safe one if you go on to tom cheese rights channel which is ev diy that's it and, and um, if anyone doesn't know his channel he's converted a bmw z4 um, and he's Great. doing he's doing a mad body kit on it as well. Uh, he, he certainly changed the body on it. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah, I think he's got a tribute automotive uh, body awesome. kit. Mm. Um, and he came down and and had one of these BMW packs off me that I got on his behalf. So I mean that one was one of the more expensive ones. I paid eight hundred pounds wow. for a twelve kilowatt hour pack out of a twenty twenty one car. And prices are coming down rapidly, no pun intended. So, um, yeah. Someone just the other day bought a um, EV5 battery pack, 55 kilowatt hour. EV, or, EV6, you mean? Or do you no, mean no, Ionic MG, 5? MG5. Uh, MG5, yeah. Right, yeah MG5. Much, was it the 61 uh, kilowatt or the 51? 55, um, 51 oh. or 55, whichever one it is. See, uh, I'm an expert at that sort of thing, Paul. Yeah, see, I'm useful I in my head. <laughs> um, well, and I think they played um two eight. Oh wow. Yeah, because it cost me four and a half thousand pounds for my 44 kilowatt hour MG ZS pack about a year and a half ago. Just shows how it, and that was a really good deal. EV breakers, just to give them a plug there from them. Great guy. Uh he can really help. And um, going back to um David's got a really good question actually. Uh, David from EV Quip, great for modified EV parts. ID3 body kit, love the look of it, by the way, David. Um, is it better to stick to pre-2000 cars, pre-CAN bus for simplicity, which is what I did. Of you are actually getting them registered as an EV mm. because DVLA, they won't change the tax class. They won't change the fuel type. If it's 2001 onwards. If it's 2001, which... I think is potentially lethal because even if they're not going to change the tax class, they should change the fuel type so the emergency services know what they're turning up to. That's a bloody good point, Paul. But that they, don't, really they just refuse flat out to do it. Yeah. Apparently and just, on safety grounds. 
that's just bonkers because um if it, that comes that makes a really good point because something that we're and again sorry to bore people with my build um but what we do with the tvr is i'm going to make sure and i haven't got it on the tesla is get a green plate make sure that we've got um arrows and you know information so you can find the battery cutoffs and um there's plan to have like uh the spec online just for the emergency services because all these things are really important when you're doing an ev conversion because you don't want to put other people's lives at risk and while there's no regulations we need to make sure that we're you know ahead of the game because we don't want some buddy who's not doing the right thing to spoil it for everybody else essentially well, well, you know my my feelings on a certain build out that I, I won't name, but it has Tesla modules supported on bits of all thread in a clear plastic storage container. And as far yeah, as I'm concerned, said. it shouldn't it just shouldn't be allowed on the road. It, it's nice. so so potentially dangerous. And the guy yeah. doesn't care. It's my safety. No, you share the road with other people. It's everybody's safety. I think I might know the one you mean, but yeah, it's that's not really going to help help things, is it? At the end of the day, so but yeah, no, it. it I personally went pre two thousand, David. I think there is can can bus help though, Paul? Can the can bus help? It can actually make things easier because if you can get the can logs from the dashboard, so mm. you know the RPM signals and. Uh, fuel gauge data and temperature gauge data, you can then get all that data out of your um, drive system, build an interface, transmit and repurpose your entire dashboard without having to, you know, uh, buy specialized instruments. I mean, a lot of what, uh, for instance, Moggy does at Electric Classic Cars is they're using traditional gauges mm. that will accept CAN bus data. Yeah. And then they're getting the CAN bus out of the inverters and the chargers and the BMS and displaying it on the on the dash. The the trick is uh, and Jamie's doing this with his he's got a BMW D D diesel. No, Jamie he's got a BMW he's doing another project. Yeah, on his BMW E46, I think it is. Yeah, with with the um uh Toyota hybrid uh 450h transmission. Yes. So a lot of people don't realize that not only can you repurpose electric motors out of crash cars, but you can also repurpose, um, and I don't know if it's with other brands, but the Lexus hybrid gearbox, because it has a rather strong motor in there. And we've seen not only Jamie is doing it on this diesel BMW E46, but uh, Silent Classics have done it on the 240Z. Uh, and they've got some serious power out of that gearbox. Do, do you know if there are I any other gearboxes? Uh, well, the the um, IS or LS three hundred H. Yeah. So, um, anything, anyone other than the Lexus gearboxes? Do you know? Well, Damien Maguire, um, yeah. EV BMW, and and one of the leading developers on the open inverter projects. Yeah, he's got a great. Um, he's got a great, um, great channel as well. Uh, yeah. Very good sense of humour. So, yeah. Sorry, my my cat was uh, meowing away. Leela. Saying hello to the world. Yeah, my, mine must be asleep because she's not screaming at the door. Um, but he he's I think he's just doing something with one of the BMW uh PHEV gearboxes. Um, but that one's an eight-speed auto. The 450H is a two-speed, which is really uh, nice, but it's a big heavy unit. Right. The LS 300 is a single speed, and what what a lot of prob one of the things that people have not considered is it is it's a 3.33 to 1 reduction ratio in the gearbox right which means you start needing like a 2.5 diff ratio okay and if you haven't well you're going to have a very limited top speed I, I ran the calculations with somebody the other day and i think the motor in that will run to about 14,000 rpm okay and at 14,000 RPM with the stock gearing in whatever it was they were converting, uh, that would be a top speed of 65 miles an hour. Which is fine for many. <laughs> well, if it's around town, then 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 fine. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this I is... I wouldn't recommend 65 around town, Paul. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, funny enough, that, that, that limit. No, that, yeah, I'm sure screaming at that sort of uh, revs as well, um, RPM. 
how density has got a really good question here so he said could you please explain to us briefly what is the process of conversion and old car into an ev in terms of homologation legislation certification regulation etc um the cynical answer is whatever the dvla decided is on any particular day uh, depending on the weather um <laughs> but, but the non-cynical version i think power density was looking for paul um, uh the, the, i mean the basic one i guided john through this on the beetle and it was no problem for him yeah um was that they the the dvla a number of years ago decided there are certain things you can't do like you can't change the engine in your own car it has to be done by a garage right the ev conversion has to be done by a garage the usual solution is you make friends with your local garage and you go along uh, to them and say would you do me a receipt for the conversion work and a uh, more legal way? <laughs> well, well, the, the say legal. well uh, how, how did John How did John do it? More or less that. I think he just went to his local garage and said, you know, would you do me a receipt for having fitted the motor and, and the battery boxes and whatever? Okay. Um, I mean, the well, last... Careful, I, we'll have to be careful uh, what we say on this channel because uh, I do know that... The internet is rife with ridiculousness at the moment and uh, people getting in trouble for saying stuff on YouTube. So we'll yeah, give that one I mean, it's, it's to the point where you can change the engine on your car. Yeah. Which people do. People change the engine on their car because the engine failed. Yeah, in true. theory, you then need to tell DVLA and right. you need a receipt for having had the work done because it has to be done by a professional. Right, interesting. But well, of course, how do the DVLA find out? Because they're not enforcing checking of engine numbers. So they've made it so hard to do that you just don't tell them. And they have no enforcement. It, it's a ridiculous system. Um, I mean, I know that Mike, uh, Mike Taylor of Lotus Bits uh, put one of Lotus Bits engine in his own private car right and then had to get his company to write a receipt to say that it had been fitted by them so that lotus it could actually have company, company by the way if you've got a lotus yeah yes. Three. we've got the mod the mod scotsman's just put mot first as an ev then apply to the dvla they ask for photos of the conversion then they will most likely inspect it yeah the problem I, I've seen, and, and this, this is the same as registering classic vehicles that have been off the road and don't have a registration document, mm. is I know people who've sent the same set of documents in time after time after time, every time they're rejected, and eventually they send them in and it just comes back. Interesting. And you could, it can just come across someone's desk and it's like, no, why? You know, the, the, the number of problems over the years I've had with the DVLA, the latest being um, a final reminder for not declaring SORN on a vehicle that was off-road in 1988, 10 years before the introduction of SORN, where it is not actually possible to declare SORN. Well, we've got uh, we've got an example here from Callum, who's got a very delightful beetle, and I can't wait to see it again. Yep, same with me, but took them months to agree. They revoked my number plate without telling me. Wow. Yeah. It's getting to the point where people will just do conversions, and if they're not going to get the tax benefit, they just won't tell the DVLA at all. They won't mm. tell the insurance company, but it's an incorrectly registered vehicle, and what, what might that do? Yeah. Um, and and this is a modified vehicle, your, your IVA. Yeah. Well, this, this is, you know, something that when I first started this process, what I wanted to do when I got time was to actually start, I'd say campaigning sounds a bit strong, but start pushing for more regulation. And this is something that I know that EV conversion um, businesses out there are doing more of. And we've got the likes of Lunas, who, funnily enough, with uh, who I work with, we, we actually work them as well. Um, they've got all these, you know, bin lorries that are being converted. So it'd be really interesting to find out what their process is. If it's, you know, if it's any easier, 
Um, so, because obviously they've they got probably end up having to go through like a an IVA. But if they're doing a set, you can. Pro I think there's a way of basically saying if you're doing them all the same, you only have to do one, and you amortize the the cost. Yeah. Um, a lot of this is really a nonsense for a one-off conversion. But I don't. I, I'm. I sort of have a foot in both camps. I'd like it to be both easier and better regulated. Yes. Absolutely. I'd like to say yeah. you must have a battery isolation system. Show us that you have one. Mm. Don't have to go through any formal testing, but you have to show us that you have one. Show us that you've got stuck contact to detection. Yeah. I mean, this is something that, that people like Johannes, I talked to him about it, and he's like, yeah, that 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 I've had that. It'd be a good idea to build some detection in to, to know. Um, the muscle Johannes is one of the guys that um, started Open Inverter for him, isn't he, with um, Damien? Yes, you must try and have him on. He, he, he drove over from Germany to visit Fully Charged Live in his converted Volkswagen to run. And then pop, popped up to visit me what, a couple of weeks before. What conversion was done in the Touran out of interest? What sort of motor? That's a Nissan Leaf motor. And originally a 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf pack. I believe it's now got a, a 40 kilowatt hour pack in it. Right. And he was using CCS charging, but they've now got some um, open source CCS um, oh, okay. working. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, it's ridiculous. It's easier to register a home converted EV in Germany. No way. But yep. Germany, I was going to say, like, Germany are normally quite, um, yeah, they're quite harsh on modified vehicles, aren't they? They they have a lot more rules, but they tend to be very well defined, so you know what you've got to do. Now, he's actually cut the structure to fit the battery pack in. Right, okay. And that's not a problem. Interesting. What is different is... Whereas here, a lot of people are, for instance, using an Outlander motor with a Toyota Prius inverter. Yeah. Can't do that in Germany because EMC, which is electromagnetic um, compatibility, they want the inverter and the motor to be a matched set. Hmm. Interesting. So you know that those two systems are being put together and tested. Right, okay. Now, it, for yeah. most people, it's not a problem. And in fact, with things like the Outlander motor, you can use the Outlander inverter and the CAN bus commands for that have been reverse engineered. Mm. The difference then is you're limited to the 60 kilowatt peak, whereas the motor's probably good for 100. Yeah. Because if you well, look at the um, motor, someone like Dala, if anyone, uh, one of my old videos ages ago, uh, I did a little report on... There's a YouTuber, Dala, who's in Finland, I think, certainly Scandinavia, works for Kempower, ironically, which are charges that I sell. And he's got a great channel and he, you know, uh, talked about upgrading the inverter on his leaf, which improved the performance of the leaf. Uh, then he had to improve the battery and, and so and so forth. So yeah, there are ways to modify EVs, which not many people know other than the, the, the early leaf motor had stronger magnets and more torque. Yes, I remember you telling me this. This yeah. this was something I was going to do for the TVR. And then I, um, thankfully, um, and, and I do still think it's a good thing, Callum. Uh, Callum found me a link for a modified uh, Tesla small drive unit for the TVR, which, you know, when I say I've got a TVR with a Nissan Leaf motor, although I know the performance is, you know, can be really, really good, a TVR with a Tesla motor and it sounds well if you go and check exciting. out uh arlen sansom's youtube channel right arlen um, samson samson i think samson. it is um and he's got he had a honda civic crx with a leaf motor in it oh Built yeah his own inverter and the, <coughs> the video of it on a dyno at a drag trap producing 300 horsepower wow Impressive. So I got up to about 220 kilowatts then. Well, I mean, if you if you look at what Nissan did, the motor was originally 80 kilowatt, mm. but that's actually to protect the battery. Right. Um, if you've seen the GR86 conversion in Germany, 
Oh, he, no, I've seen the one in America, the Scala. Is it Scala? No, the, no this is a G, GT86. Yeah. Um, oh, GT86, sorry. With, it's it's What's still the using here? the early Nissan Leaf inverter. What's it called? Uh, is there a channel I can go to? Um, on that one, I, I don't remember. You should, you probably find it a GT. There's pic, there's, there's video of it doing donuts. Uh, that would be nice to look at. Uh, um, oh yeah, no, I've actually yes, I do remember this because I remember checking it out. Funnily enough, um, but that's using early leaf motor and early leaf inverter, but yeah. with the open source control board, so we can just wind wind it up until it goes pop. <laughs> And he hasn't quite made it go pop. Let me uh, let me transfer. Sorry, it would be much easier if I had someone to do this for me. When I when I watch the um, <laughs> when I watch uh, I don't know uh, Joe Rogan, he's got someone to do it for him, which is quite quite handy. Um, but this isn't the EV, is it? No. Hang on is a minute. It? Blasphemy. <laughs> let me go back. There was, I found it earlier. Here we go. GT86 EV conversion introduction. So there's a whole YouTube channel on it. But yeah, it's just adverts because I'm that tight. I won't pay for um, uh, YouTube premium. But yeah, oh, if anyone wants to check it out, go and have a look. So. Yeah, so he, he's sorry, 100, don't be he's sorry. 120 <laughs> kilowatt out of the leaf inverter and motor. That's really strong. The yeah. early one, and I think they reckon the 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 later one with the weaker motor. Yep. Uh, will do about 140 kilowatt. That's and then more. the highest spec leaf from Nissan, mm. still using the um, EM57 motor, is 217 PS. Okay. So all they've done is put more power into the motor, and it's it's and possibly up up the cooling slightly and power to weight you put that in a lightweight ice car you know i'm not going to say a mini because minis are tough to do because of space i mean that's a hell of a lot of power isn't it so now yeah i mean some people would say and it, it, it was a little bit of a thing that i i know why you did the tvr the way you did but i would say to you how big are your rear tires well, it's not massive they're like 15 15s 15s. What, 215s? I'd, I'd, I'd be it's guessing, guessing but I would... Say again? I think 215 is the stock size, same as my Excel. Probably. Go on, what yeah. are you going to hit me with here? Well, how much power can you actually put down to the road? Well, this is very interesting because when we were talking about this before, and I was still umming and ahhing for a while of what Motors put in, you made really good points, you know, about Lotus. You know, what do Lotus do? Lotus don't put big engines in vehicles. They put in exciting engines in vehicles. And it's all about lightweight and something that's, you know, a good compromise or something that's, you know, it's all about the engagement. And, you know, I've had cars like a Nissan Silvia S14 without a turbo, which is 100 and, I don't know, 70 brake horsepower. It's been one of the most fun cars I've ever owned because you can, you know, properly take, take it by the scruff of the neck and absolutely, you know, thrash it to pieces and have a lot of fun. Whereas the TVR Griffith 5 liter I had, you know, you cannot go hell for leather in that car. You can't go flat out in that car. It's it's just it's just too much. But then again, there's the added excitement of being able to steer with the acceleration pedal. So you know, it's it's about getting that mix. It's not like I put a large drive unit in it, Paul. Come on now. Uh, no, but it's things like you know when when um, electric classic conversions did the uh, Tesla powered Mini. Yeah, and they they put it in track mode at 300 horsepower. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't draw 300 horsepower from the battery. Right. Okay. Because you know it will just break traction, at which point the load goes away. So you yeah. never actually. Yes, we've turned the number that it will go. It will limit to to 300 horsepower. It never gets there. It just doesn't have the grip. No, absolutely. Okay. You know what? I'm going to jump on this one because this is a really interesting one, and it is a really good idea, especially with MG coming out with their um, Roadster, which is about 70-odd thousand pounds. How easy and affordable would it be to convert the original, I say original, the um, the rear-engined, mid-engine, sorry, uh, MGF, the comeback kid? <laughs> 
I like the way you put that. Uh, the, this the big problem with an MGF is the fact that it's an MGF and it's there f- and they've got really cheap and it's therefore probably in bad condition. Yeah. Um, small mid-engine cars were popular. Fiat X19s. I mean, I love oh. a Fiat X19. I had a oh, boat to, Let's have a look at one. Um, and I, think I did see one that had been done recently, actually. Um, well, I mean, I drove one in 97. Wow. Because um, Bob, Bob Schneeweiss, another one of the really old names um, in the EV world, he built a racing car called um, Snow White. Schneeweiss, Snow White. Schneeweiss being Snow White in German, basically. Yeah. Um, no, no, not not an X19. It, it um, EV Snow White. It might be on YouTube. Um, I know there's some footage. If you go to my channel, and you, um, that sounds too far. That sounds like a long. <laughs> let's 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 keep on the na- uh, straight and narrow if we can. So MGF is it a good or bad conversion to do? I think it would make a good conversion. I mean, it would be um, a smaller battery pack, though. I mean, as the battery pack density goes up and up. There is a fair amount of room in mid-engine cars once you've removed, you know, big radiators. And, and so the X19 is – think about the X19. X19 has got massive amounts of luggage space in it. It's like twice okay. that of the Mark One MR2, at least double. Really? Because so I was much yeah, better packaged. The Mark Three MR2, I used to sell these many years ago, and there's literally no luggage space. Um, so, but they were a great car to drive. Um, so, yeah, that would be a tricky one. The, I know that there's a couple of Mark One MR2s out there that have been converted, and there's a fair amount of space in them, I think. They're, they're, they're doable once, once you've thrown away the spare wheel in the front and, yeah. and yeah. thrown away. Um, some of the other bits and pieces, you know, the radiators and stuff, because you need much smaller radiators. It's yeah. it's totally doable. The the X19 is just incredible packaging. Mm. It's a physically smaller car than the Mark One MR2, with at least double, if not triple, the luggage space. Right. Okay. Um, you know, the, the the MR2 it was Toyota build quality, but the X19 I just find it a much better car to drive. The, yeah. the only totally styling. The only mid-engine now, now we're on mid-engine cars. We've got to talk about uh, a Porsche Boxster, and you know what I'm going to go on to after that. We'll, we'll leave, well, we'll leave that done. for you. Boxers Say again. Been, people have done Boxsters. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I saw one going around the track. Tesla motor. That that seems to be. I think that would be a really, really and good you, car. Are you familiar on. with uh, New Zero Land? New Zero Land. No. Uh, it's it's an American guy living in New Zealand was doing vid- lots of videos on riding zero motorcycles around New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Um, but jumped ship to Energica because he wanted bigger range, more performance. He is currently converting one of my favourite cars, the Honda Beat. Oh, cool. Nice. Nice. Now What's, that got other one? S- What's the other one with the gold wing doors? We were talking about this the other day. Auto Z1. Yes. Very or cool. Or Suzuki Cara. Very Same cool. Car. Well, um, going back to uh, the other mid-engine car that you might have uh, in your vicinity, Paul. I'm very jealous of this car. Very jealous. Yes, Lotus Esprit. And funnily enough, Zoe has chipped in here. She's saying, we were talking about this earlier, Lotus philosophy, simplicate, then add more lightness. There we go. Was it simplify? It's usually they say say, simplify and add lightness. There Um, we go. There we go. So, what what are your plans for the Lotus, Paul? Because oh, you've got two Which Lotus. One? Lotus, yes. Have you got? Is it two or three? Three. The plural of Lotus, by the way, is Lotus. There's an official Lotus press release from the seventies. Lotus? No, it's Lotus. Is it okay? It's a self plural. Okay. According to Lotus themselves, it's 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 Lotus. So, just to clarify um, for the viewers that didn't know and haven't watched the original uh, Charge Heads video, please go back and watch it. Just put in Paul Compton Charge Heads, you'll find it, and we'll see the the Lotus collection uh, minus one. Is you've got the uh, two elites, Excels, Excels. Oops, throw stuff at the screen. Excels, which 
we shouldn't talk about the XLs because they're an amazing car and I don't want other people to know about them because I want to buy one one day and I don't want prices to go up. But you probably want them to go up, Paul, don't you? Because you've already got to. Um, well, I don't, I'm not interested in the values. Um, I am. I am. But I yeah, so. Stay affordable. So very exciting Lotus. We've got a Lotus Excel. It's a four cylinder, high, uh, high compression. Um, 150 brake horsepower they're 160 for the standard compression and 180 for the um se high compression there we go and it's a four seater as well so good for family two yeah uh, no you could i've i've got in one in, in the back and i had it was a really good space it was a prop uh it was a two plus three i'd say um, it's a generous two plus two it is it is it, so it is obviously you've two. got you've got two at the moment and what are you doing with that? Because I know that you've you've obviously jumped onto other projects recently for you know various reasons. But what is your plan for the Lotus Excel in terms of uh, electrifying that? Um, that um, is having a Nissan Leaf motor, and I've probably changed my mind, and I'm going to go for the EM57 simply because it's a little bit smaller and it's a good chunk lighter. M57, what? The EM57, which is the later Leaf motor. Early right. one was the EM61, right? Which was, I think, um, up to 2013. So, why and have you gone with the later one? It's a little bit smaller, um, and I'm a little tight on space, um, and it's also um, good 10 kilos lighter, right? Um, oh, it may, wow. maybe even a little bit more. Yeah, um, it's basically rated at the same power, but it's at slightly higher RPM, which which helps with my gearing. Yeah, uh, that's going on to one of um, what was um, um, EV Zero now Felton. Yeah, onto one of their rear wheel drive um, gearboxes. Yes, and which I nearly went for the TVR, great value, but yeah, I wasn't sure if I could push the power, so I didn't go for that in the end. Look well, the, the limit is the torque. Um, on the gearbox, and you know, I had I had to very I had to negotiate with Chris to get him to sell me one. Oh, really? um, yeah, be because of the um, the torque limitations. But I, I mean, they are putting it behind their Zonic One Hundred and Eighty. Yeah, and they're just limiting the torque, um, but then extending the torque further up the rev range. So that's a one hundred and eighty kilowatt motor. Yeah. Um, and the issue is the talk. And also, um, I have some motorsport contacts and I may get the internals shot peened. OK, which um, it stress relieves the gears and makes them less prone to uh, fatigue failure. And they usually wreck on a sort of 20 to 25 percent increase in torque handling capability. And given that the gearbox is almost certainly sourced from an internal combustion engine application, mm. the overrating is much larger because of the, the, the torque pulses from an engine. And behind an electric motor, it gets an easier life, so it's probably capable of more, more torque than it's rated for originally. So Callum's made a good point here. So will the leaf motor conversion run without keeping its original gearbox? How are you doing that, Paul, on your Lotus? um the it doesn't care about the gearbox no yeah the there's um a positioning coder on the end of the motor and if you keep if you keep the motor and inverter together because they are a matched pair if you yeah. change the motor or inverter you have to reprogram the inverter to the motor that has now been open sourced and could be done you can then drive the inverter via can bus commands and all that's been reverse engineered Right. Okay. But you're limited to the power limit built into the inverter, and that can't be changed. So that's but what you're you going to change the logic board to the open inverter board. You then can just do whatever you like to the point where you blow things up. And what? Yeah, don't want to do that. What's the uh, battery size that you're going? So I, I can't help permanent the Lotus Excel pictures here. Exactly but... the same as yours. Oh, really? The, the MTZS. No, don't tell me how much you got it for, Paul, because I know what you like. You'd have you'd have found the best deal going. So you probably. I think it was similar price. to yours because I also bought it from the same source. Uh, okay, good good deal then. Good deal. I mean, I only I only paid, I, got, I got a brand new Peugeot two hundred and eight E. Oh yeah. Pack for 
just over three grand delivered. Wow. Well, let's let's go on to your other Lotus that I mean, know that we're talking about your conversions now. We'll go back on to the general ones in a minute. So if anyone's got a conversion or any information that they want to uh, ask about technical or otherwise, please ask on the uh, comments. And everyone, please like the video. It really helps the channel, really helps, you know, push it to places where, uh, pe you know, where, where people are interested in the EV conversion. It's, this is a great resource. So here we are. This is what we're talking about. What an amazing looking car. It's all about the wedge. Yeah. You know, that, from to, one Lotus to me, wedge to another. To me, the S3 is the best Esprit. What color is yours? Uh, mine is a dark blue or darkish, sort of navy blue d d metallic. Um, let's, try, let's try and get it in keeping with the one that you've got. Oh, look at that. It's, it's basically the Essex color. It's that sort of color. That is um, just that that is the turbulent spree with all the side skirts and stuff, which I don't like. Oh, look at that. Oh, I love it. I mean, I know you, I know your taste. My car is actually on YouTube somewhere as the Lotus with a W. Because it's it's a fairly well known car. It okay. was built by a guy called Dean. Yeah. And it was a slammed spree. Yeah, because it had um, air suspension on your your Lotus Esprit, didn't it? Yes, it also has an Alfa Alfa Busso in it. I think one of the uh, one of the people uh, commenting, I think it might may well be Doug. Is it the Bond one? So, are you planning to go on the water? It is one or? of the Bond ones. Yes, but because it's water type. Um, <laughs> it is not Wet Nelly, no. which was the original Esprit. It is um it is the one that was was fitted with the ski rack it, or it's it's to go lotus full lotus nerd talking about uh bond villains i've got i've got my own cat here in the old uh yes. <laughs> so i'm no felt moment um yeah i'm i'm, I'm getting to carried away now so how, what are you going to do with the Lotus? I know I'm going to ask you for a time frame on these, Paul, because, you know, I want to start putting some pressure on these amazing builds you've got going on. But what, well, what's your plan for the Lotus Esprit? How, what are you going to do with Lotus that? The Lotus Esprit is going to go back on the road as an ice at the moment. Um, because I the, the thing <laughs> is, when I, I built the Sirocco in about 2000. Yeah. But I ended up selling it for various reasons. Got offered it back in, or the guy I sold it to got back in touch in about 2018. Mm -hmm. And then he basically, because he wanted to get back on the road, and then he went through divorces and redundancies and all sorts of things. And it, it, he offered it back to me, and it had been stood outside without a cover on it since about 2009 and was in a fairly poor state and right. i felt i ought to rescue it um i was then going to have it go to a local restoration company yeah um but they um then the lockdown happened basically right. um because i was then going to be because i'd always wanted to do an esprit ever since doing the racing in america in the 90s i, I wasn't driving i was doing all the development work and mechanicing yeah i'd always wanted to do one and um i went looking for a spree and a spree prices had just gone up so much um there we go here she is that's the one isn't technology sitting wonderful when i can get it to work <laughs> yes yeah, so it's sitting on its tires it's sitting so low there you go sitting on a porsche what was it 914 was it? That's a 914 race car, and who had the legendary John Wayland on the left there. There we go. Yeah, there is where it was slammed. Well, I'm very, you know, you never know. Someone might want to buy my TVR, and I tell you what, if I'm, although I keep on saying I want a more practical car, I would love to do a Lotus Esprit. It would have to be Tesla large drive unit. That would be unbelievable. I don't, what's the space like on the Lotus Esprit? Is it doing a conversion? It's it's doable. Yeah, I mean, if you think they do DeLoreans. Yeah, is it well, the DeLorean, the DeLorean is basically just using all of the um, the Esprit architecture? It's not it's not sharing very many actual components, but it, it 
it's all the architecture is all it's derived from the esprit of the of the time and here we have the absolute icon that is the gee whiz and if anybody wants to have a good old laugh at the end of that video paul kindly lets me drive the gee whiz and i'll tell you what it's an experience um whether it's a what I wanted to forget, I'm not sure, but it's certainly an experience. But well, my, um... my one can actually get out of its own way. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it it's Lotus type tuning. All it's done is a weight reduction by having missan leaf cells in it rather right. than the original lead acid. There we go. Um, but you know, it, it will actually do 55 miles an hour. Um, not yeah. that you necessarily want to. Um, and it will it will it will get out into gaps in traffic. Um quite well so mm. you know it's my shopping trolley it's literally what i run down to tesco's in which is what trikey is for which I'll, i'm sure i'll uh, i'll have to pull up a video on on trikey in a second because not many people on my uh, youtube channel watch the trikey conversion and i'll tell you what this was to cut my teeth but actually what happened was um yeah it was this is a great um great machine and it is my yeah it's my it's my daily uh for for the shops and it is great fun but um there is a really good question which we will go on uh to now so power density is the um there we go on trikey there amazing machine um is is a charger really needed in an architecture if the ev uses ccs2 and um, is a charger really needed in an architecture if the EV uses a CCS2 inlet, slow and fast charging architecture, CCS2 power distribution voltage? I don't but know. You need mean. an onboard charger to be able to charge at home. Say again, sorry. You need a charger on board the vehicle in order to charge yes. at home. Yeah, any AC charger you will need, any AC charging at home, you will need an onboard charger, correct? Yeah, I mean, if you, it, I mean, in theory, if you had invested in your own CCS rapid charger to use at home, then you wouldn't need an onboard charger. <laughs> but that seems like a very expensive solution. And I must say, now, if you've got three phase and you want DC charging, give me a call because I can help. Um, so, going uh, mod Scotman, is it a copper coloured one with turbo on it? So I missed that one. No, that would be wonderful. Well, that, that was the the second Bond car was a turbo with three. Uh, there we go. I in, preferred the um, white one. I was the white fan. I'm afraid. Uh, well, there the was a white one. one in the same film. There we go. Start of the film was a white one, and the production crew decided they didn't want that because it was going to be shot against snow. Uh, so uh, famously, it's fitted with an anti theft system. There's a little sticker in the window. But apparently yes. the effective anti-theft system is that someone tries to break in and the car explodes. That's right. That's which right. doesn't actually seem to be like a very effective anti-theft system because you end up not still not having a car. <laughs> so we've got a really interesting question here. Uh, and Callum agrees. Um, do EV conversions done well increase the return on when selling them? Mm. <laughs> I would say like most modified cars, no, they lose massive amounts of money. Unless you get some very, very specific person that wants that particular car electrified. You know, I never set out to do the TBR to make money on it. And, you know, and funnily enough, there is uh, ML Speed Shops. Oh, I wonder who that is. Not seen that before. Um, thanks for joining in. Esprit is one of the cars that will not do well on resale if converted to EV, but would be pretty cool. You say that, I mean, you just don't know, do you? There could be someone out there like me or like Paul. He's just got a load of money or he's, he's made a load of money. He lives in London. He loves the spree shape. And you've got a Tesla powered Lotus, which is more reliable, which is faster. I, mean, I think there's going to be a big difference between an amateur conversion and one, for instance, done by electric classic cars or Absolutely. classics or one of the other people. But most of those builds... Mm -hmm. They're just being done for the customer because the customer loves the car. And that's Absolutely. actually a really important point is you've got to have some investment in the car mm. or in the project. So if you just want to build your own EV, it doesn't matter what car you convert. 
just the smaller, lighter, but with more space vehicle you convert, the easier and cheaper it's going to be. Because, mm. um, I mean, half the stuff the electric classic cars do, the first part of the project is somebody else fully restores the car. I mean, it might be delivered to them needing restoration and they organise the restoration, but the first six months, year of one of their projects is somebody mm. else restoring the car. That's going to be that's going to be the second part of my TVR build is restoring uh, to a certain extent everything that needs restoring on the car. So, well, I mean so, that, yeah. that is my my Excel project is um, which I was meant to be doing the Excel whilst um, you know a restoration company did the um, the Sirocco, and yeah. I was just going to put the original drive system back in, but put some lithium batteries in it. Um, but I ended up doing, you know, I'm halfway through all the, well, all the structural repairs are done. It's now onto cosmetic repairs to the shell. Um, well, I'm hoping that soon when you've got a bit of an update, Paul, I'll come down with the, you know, with the camera and we'll have a proper, you know, look. And anyone that's interested, jump onto Paul's channel because I'm sure he'll uh, put some updates on there as well. Going back to anyone that's uh, in the comments at the moment, if there are any more questions, any more cars people are thinking of, whack them in now. Um, in terms of cars, now, Paul, I completely forgot about this, and I don't want to go too over the hour, unless depending on what your time's like today. I'm, I'm okay. I, I can talk about EV conversions till the cows come home. And I haven't got any cows, so we could be here sometime. So um, I've written in notes a selection of cars, which I've done mm -hmm. over the last, I don't know, uh quite a few months actually so here we go is 200 lexus is 200 i saw you know keep in keeping with where i see ev conversions being more fun real -wheel drive you know real -wheel drive you know you could make it a little bit you could have the in keeping of the motor you could could you have the motor from the lexus uh, hybrid gearbox to power it um so any any thoughts on the IS two hundred? Is that a good or a bad? Well, I mean, if you're prepared to do things like give up your boot space and just put a battery box in the boot, mm. yeah, probably a really easy car to do because you're going to end up with the in if the gearbox is now your propulsion unit, you end yep. up with the engine bay of space to put components. And yeah. this is typically what Damien's doing on his stuff. He's just filling the boot up with batteries because unless you're the kind of person who fills the boot on a daily basis it's a it's a compromise to make the conversion um an easy one i suppose just, the only negative which is something that ralph on the tvr tesla build uh wanted to make sure that the batteries were uh between the wheelbase from a safety point of view yeah i mean but it's really I mean, sad and boring this. with safety but uh <laughs> yeah i mean the, the you know keeping but you usually can sort of use the front half of the boat yeah, yeah, okay. And keep, keep the good. weight, you know, on the axle. So it's not it's not a silly idea at all. It could actually end up with quite a nice car, but it might be a compromising <laughs> a one. You know, when I yeah. when I did the Sirocco, before the DVLA started worrying about cutting, I modified the boot floor and the batteries were through the boot floor. I mm. lost an inch of depth in the boot floor. What, you know, what did you do with yourself? Back back in the day, you know, people would come and look at it and go, "Oh, I suppose the boot's full of batteries." And I just open the hatch. They go, "Which stock in here?" Yeah, it wasn't. I'd lost. I remember much. seeing. I remember seeing the photos. And anyone that's interested, jump on again the uh, the video I discussed earlier. Now I know someone's already done one of these, and I think these are cool as hell. Volvo three hundred and forty, and I think what makes them a really good conversion is the fact that they have a rear mounted gearbox. So the motor can go in the back where the drive shafts are. Am I right? Um, yeah, I think think they're running um, a torque tube, um, mm. and then might just you. That's probably where something like a Hyper Nine, because it's a relatively small diameter motor and long mm. compared to most production EVs, tend to be much shorter and fatter. You might be able to get get away with that. Nineteen fours were a thing back in the day. What do you mean Volvo 340 real? It's an absolute belter of a car. It's probably because I've had one, Callum. Uh, and it was my you know first introduction to the drifting. Uh this was before they were all ruined by all the you know the drifters out there. Um but yeah, funnily enough, uh oh, we've got 
potentially one of your faves, Reliance uh, Schmitter. How do you pronounce it? Schmitter. Schmitter, sorry. Would be ace. Yes, good shout. Yeah, no, a number of them have been done, um, you know, lead acid conversions, very old school, but they're basically a TR6 chassis. Mm. Um, So, you know, anything with a separate chassis can be can be quite easy because there's there's usually lots of mounting points that you can take advantage of and any cutting you have to do on the body or well, the yeah. body's completely non-structural right right so if you wanted to cut through the rear rear floor for a battery box well that's fine because it's a non-structural part and the deep you, you uh, have, having once though taken a friend's scimitar to be MOT'd and it failed on rust in the sills. Okay. But they're fiberglass. Uh, that doesn't quite... You ever you ever been to a garage that's trying it on? Oh, uh, okay. Really horribly because they haven't... One of those garages, was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just charge you, charge you for the... Uh... The uh, was it the uh, radiator cap on your Beetle air cooled, and uh, you know the oil filter for your Tesla Model Three, and you know although they do have an oil filter underneath one of my videos, check it out. Um, the only problem with Reliant Scimitar is they're bloody expensive, so there is a bit of a issue there. Not, you can get them from five hundred quid. Can you? Yeah, it'll be a big, big project, but they yeah, rusty, can... it'll have rusty seals on that one, won't it? Paul? Oh. Um, <laughs> one of the things is that the Essex V6, right, which are now very sought after and hard to find. Not, I'm trying to think. There are cars out okay. there that have already been robbed for parts, no. and you know, um, big, they're one of those cars like my Excel. My Excel has sat in someone's front garden from since 2006. So fiberglass shells, so the shell's not rotting. Although yeah. I had quite a lot of rust on the chassis um, to, to deal with, um, which well, is not that... in itself because Lotus Bits have got a stack of good chassis. Yeah. Well, we've got 80s Astra GSI with the digital dash. I think you just want the digital dash. You don't care about the Astra because no one really cares about an Astra, let's be honest. And um, you can think of much better cars with digital dashes. Or just get a better car and put your own digital dash in is probably a better idea. Uh, well, they're doable. They, I mean, just like, you know, Mark One in America, a um, company called Electro Automotive did a bolting kit for the, the Rabbit, Mark One Golf. Oh, yeah. And it was literally, I think they reckoned 50 hours to convert a car. But okay. that was batteries in the boot, lead acid batteries in like an angle iron frame. Because um, it's only a 96 volt system. And yeah, the adapter play series wound motor, and they sold a lot of those kits. These are sold, sell a book called Convert It. Yes, yeah, I was thinking you've got your books in the background. And while you talk about you show your books in the background there, Paul, which you uh, you uh, these, highlighted these, to me earlier. These, right. This was yeah, given to me my friend, friend Mike, who I did the, a lot of the racing with. There we go, there this we go, Corvette, edition, earlier 1980. First edition was 77. There we go. Now there's one conversion book. And there's another from 1980. I would have thought it's 70s. got brown cover on it. But uh, moving, uh, talking about Americans. So you said the Americans were well ahead of things because of their uh, ability to have, was it batteries, wasn't it? But we'll talk about that in a second. But um, Something that really interests me, and I think it's Revolt, because there's Revolting Motorsport, which I love that name. There's also Revolt EV, and they've got a great EV conversion where I think they take a Tesla Model uh, S large drive unit and they connect it to uh, rear prop shaft and it drops into American motors. Do you know what I mean? I think they Yeah, it. I, like, I keep hearing vaporware stories about their product. Oh, right. That it doesn't actually exist in a form you can buy, that they've shown it. I mean, G- GM is supposedly working on a uh, crate motor solution. Yeah, so I heard, yeah. yeah. Because um, um, did you see the DB5 that um, Aston Martin Works Services did? 
No, I know Silent Classics are, uh, Silent Classics are doing an Aston Martin, and it's going to be the same uh, iteration as the TVR. Funnily enough, yeah, no, uh, this, this was because Aston Martin Works Services is a subsidiary of Aston Martin. I believe they're still officially part of Aston Martin, but they do all the restorations, and they will also resto mod cars. Oh, so cool. things like a, a DB5. Oh, yes, yes, I know who you mean. I yeah. was in the Bond film. Yeah. All of the footage of the car chases is played back at double speed because otherwise it would look so slow. Because <laughs> it's not a sports car. It's a very much a wallowy, soft GT. It's yeah. for wafting down to the French Riviera, not for actually going fast. Talking but of wafters, we've got um, Callum talking about 1950s Rileys. Now, I'd have to remind myself what 1950, I think I know what you mean. Yeah, something, uh, something like a Riley RM, you can pick those up quite cheaply and get yourself a lot of style. Yeah, that is super cool. That is super. But surely, the, the thing is, and this is what comes into my mind a lot of the time, is the fact that, there we go, is the fact that, these old cars are wonderful, but you need to have so many skills and crafts to be able to reproduce, you know, some of the parts needed. So maybe, and this is going back to the original Zero EV, who are now Felton, video that <clears throat> Johnny Smith did with Chris, uh, which was with the MX-5 Mark II, Mark II, Mark 2.5, where there are so many aftermarket bits. And this is something that, I think we need to start thinking about if we are doing EV conversions to make sure that they have got the backup of parts to be able to keep them on the road, not just the fact that we can change, you know, the drivetrain from uh, ICE to EV. So, so yeah, I think I think taking that into consideration is important as well. Uh, whether the my mention of the IS two hundred, whether that's going to keep going, you'd think that the Toyota parts would last a long time. You know, um, so I think Toyota yeah. are reasonably good about supporting older vehicles. Okay, Mercedes so are brand. brilliant at supporting seventies and stuff backwards. Mm. But I mean, there's there's parts you can't get for ten year old cars these days. Yeah, no, I can believe it. I've, I've, Fox and Follies. I've noticed a decent one is more than a TVR wedgie now. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Now I know what you mean now. Um, here we go. My friend of mine has an RMA with an MX-5 motor. He missed a trick. What's an RMA? That, 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 that's before the RMB that you've got your... Oh, the Riley. Right. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, there was a really cool... Audi Auto Union car. I don't know if you saw it at Late Break Show and it had a leaf motor in it. Yeah, the one we met at. That's an amazing car, that. Yeah. Absolute, absolute beauty. Yeah, that again, I've got a video of that on my channel. Really good, uh, that one. I would love to do a Citroen DS. Yeah, we've done, we, we actually talked about that right at the start of the uh, show. Oh, you, you, you I mean, I, I guess if you want to <laughs> slam it, but it, oh, it yeah. is effectively on an air ride system anyway. Mm. Um, and it's perfectly doable. The one of the problems with them is the the hydraulic system takes quite a lot of power to run. Yeah, but it can be done more efficiently, um, like the electric power steering pumps. They only have to run at a rate to support the steering, whereas a normal power. I mean, all the drift boys are blow, blow up standard st power steering pumps because they're redlining the engines and then running on full lock. Yeah. And the power steering pump is designed to provide maximum assistance when you're at, at walking speed in a parking situation. Yeah, I've, def I've definitely had my power steering boiling on an R33 Skyline of mine one at once time. Uh, well, so the down. trick is on something That's like nice. the Citroen is to run an electric motor for this pump. Mm. And rather than using the pressure relief valve, you have to build an electronic controller that gets to the required pressure and then slows the pump down to lose less energy. I guess that um, uh, Electrogenic did that on theirs. We've also got a... They may not have. They might, I mean, you know, you can just say, well, I'll just have a bigger battery pack and that's fine. Yeah. 
We've also got a mention of a Rover SD1 or a Triumph Dolomite. Well, I know what an SD1 looks like. I can't remember what a Dolomite looks like. I think it's pretty awful, if I've been completely I'm actually a bit of a fan of the, the, the Dolomite. It was the first, in the sprint form, it was the first 16-valve production car. Was it really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for the rear of it, because I, I remember, yeah, that is the rear, yeah. So I remember the rear being just a bit odd. Hang on, let me put it on the screen so I'm not alone in looking at the pictures. <laughs> oh, no, I am. Go ahead, I've, got it. I've got it up. No pun intended. Um, but, yeah, no, Rover SD1, yeah, some really interesting cars. But like I said before, you know, can we, yep, sprint. I'll put the sprint on just for you. Um, going back to my list, which is obviously, oh, yeah, some crashed ones there. Obviously, my my list is, I would say, a bit newer in terms of the cars. So I've mentioned IS two hundred. I've talked about Volvo three hundred and forty, which I think is a good one. Um, Hilux. I've got a thing about not just a Hilux pool, but the Surf, which is probably going to be more of a nightmare because you can't put a battery pack in the in the boot. But I really love a Hilux Surf. What's your thoughts on the Hilux? I mean, it should be perfectly doable. I mean the um... You know, Ford did an EV version of the Ranger. Did they? Yeah, back in the 2000s. And um, General Motors did the S10 um, okay. with the EV1 driveline. Um, I think they got so much bad publicity. Um, yeah, so the, that, that second one, the Wikipedia one, um, that that's one of the old Ford Rangers that was basically a factory conversion. Yeah. Oh, hello. Here we go. That looks more familiar. But they in the front were two-wheel drive rather than a four-wheel drive. If we're thinking about the high looks, but yeah, you know, yeah, no, I just, I just like the thought of the fact that Hilux is just so bulletproof. You know, double cab one of those, or well, um, what people would do is they'd put a tipper conversion on it. Which right. meant that they could have the battery pack under the bed and yeah. lift the bed for servicing. Uh, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Dolly Sprints, our ace, guy around the corner has uh, from me as four, blue and neck. He's uh, as bad as Paul and his Lotuses. Um, the next car, Ford Capri. Now, I've not seen anyone do a Ford Capri yet. I think that would be a really cool car to do. It's entirely possible that there's been one. Certainly, there have been Mark One and Mark Two escorts. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Well, let's have a look. Electric Ford Capri. They'll probably bring one out now in Ford. There we go. Look, they have actually got one coming out, haven't they? Well, potentially, uh, they'll probably do like they did with. Uh, the I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To me, that's just like the the Mark Three Sirocco. Is it the Mark One and Mark Two Sirocco's looked special compared to the Golf? Mark yeah. III Sirocco, I kind of go, oh, was that Sirocco? It just looks like another car. Well, I've got a thing about Sirocco's because I went from working for Audi, working to for uh, VW, and I was in a TT, um, hairdresser's car, um, and I went into a Sirocco, and I'll tell you what, even the Mark II TT felt better to drive than that Sirocco. It just wasn't a nice drive. But anyway, that's talking about ice cars. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of channels for that. Um, oh, hello. Zoe has got late FD RX7. Good luck justifying the purchase price, though. Would need to be uh, quite broken to get one at a sensible price. Beautiful yeah. car. Uh, again, particularly in, in America, I mean, one of the reasons they did the rabbit was most of the rabbits that went to America were diesels. And certainly when I was out there, a common theme was people bought brand new cars and never service them wow um and so with a fifty thousand mile cam belt life there were an awful lot of mark one rabbits in perfect condition with dead engines because because of broken belts right so you could pick them up i mean you know when i was over there in the 90s i got offered three um datsun 260z's yeah um all californian cars no significant rust, mm -hmm. all less than six hundred dollars. Wow! That's and impressive. even back then, I was so tempted to bring them home, um, pay the shipping. Big um, money's now the two sixty. Huge money now. Yeah, you know, 
But I mean, I was getting offered Porsche 914s for the same sort of money. Yeah, they, yeah, they they're have... nice and cheap. Do you know what? They're, they're coming thick and fast. We've got them going now. You know, it takes an hour and twenty-five minutes to warm to warm the comments up, Paul. So we've got Zach Speed Ford Capri looks the nuts. Yeah, I'll have to check out that particular one. Volvo P eighteen hundred S. Yes, lovely car. Yeah, I'm not sure what the space is like for batteries. Lancia Stratos. Oh, that would be a controversial one for the. Uh, the petrol heads out there and not too uh, big. No, for, for me, you see, Lancia Stratos. No, nah, it's got to be a Lancia Stratos HF. It's got to be the original Lancia Stratos. Right. Not not the kit car one. What did you say? Lancia Stratos HF? It, uh, yeah. I think they called it was the HF. Uh, yeah. The, the one on the it's second row. The oh wow! That is that reminds me of you know the Aston Martin bull dog. bulldog. See now, not many. I remember having these like us petrol heads, car enthusiasts. Uh, had we had the books that you know whoever bought us, and there was was some random vehicle or some sort of uh, top trumps, and there's always that really weird. Was it bull bulldog? Bulldog. Yeah, in William fact, Towns design. Isn't there, someone, isn't there someone who started? Oh, this is blooming ring the bell now. Yeah, that's that's just been restored recently. Yeah, there, there was a channel. What actually happened to that? Because yeah, I don't no, they, they, they've, they've run it because I mean it it it, it, um, it was a show car because um, it's a turbo. Is it twin turbo V eight? It was falling apart. I mean, there was so much rust on it. It had been that... out. It had been out to Saudi, I think, and been modified and put in storage. And what's an Arrow four by four twenty four series? That sounds very niche. It does. Very. Oh, is it almost like a Lada? What are they called Lada Reavers? Uh, neither. Neither. Oh, and which way, actually, which way round is it? Lord and Neva Cossack, Cossack being the high spec trim. They're actually a remarkably capable off roader. I've never, well, I've never seen one of those particular vehicles that that's just come up there. The, the Arrow, any Saab built, any Saab built to last forever. Well, I don't know. What would a 900 or a 9000 be like, Paul? What do you reckon? I reckon. Again, they're front wheel drive, aren't they? So they're front wheel drive, but I mean, a lot of EVs are effectively a front wheel drive transmission, even if they've got it mounted in the back. Mm. It's a transverse system that would drop into a front wheel drive car. Those Saabs, proper Saabs, 99 or a 900, is quite a unique drive system because the engine's north south, right? And, then, and is in backwards and has a um, triple hydraulic detention chain running down to the gearbox. Now, Doug has just mentioned the Pink Panther car, and I always thought it looked a bit like a Pantera, didn't it? But that's not the Pink Panther car, is it? No, it's yeah. gold, isn't it? There no. it is. Is that it? That's, that's it. Is it? Yeah, that got, got... But yeah, I think it got repainted at, at... At some stage, stage, yeah, something like that. Anyway, going back, and we digress. Let's go back to uh, uh, did, did, did take that off? Right. So, but the, yeah, the HF Stratos HF was actually a running car. It's driving to this day. Muccio Bertoni actually used to drive it to work for a while. Oh, apparently, Dolomite engine in those old Saabs too. There we go. A joint oh. project. Yeah. All uh, right. With well, the um. Going back to Mercs, now I've actually got three Mercs on my list here. I've got the 190E, built to last, you know, last forever, uh, the SEC, love the SEC, and the W124 Coupe. They're all, you know, cars that in my mind, you know, they're, they're just so, you know, bulletproof and strong and, you know, should last, outlast me. Um so yeah, any of those cars? What are your thoughts on any of those cars? The one ninety E, the I mean, set. You know, they're all they're relatively big, heavy cars. 
Mm. So you're going to be spun, spending more money on a bigger battery pack to get a decent range. But, you know, just about anything's doable, but you are getting into the, yes, it's a car you restore and then convert. Mm. And a lot of people never get to the end of their restoration. No. And yeah. And again, BMW E34, I know someone who's been restoring by himself an M5, but a later one, it's the 3.8 engine, not the 3.6 M5 E34. He's been restoring it for a couple of years now. Um, but again, decent car, built to last, loads of space. That's the sort of car, because I've, I've been thinking going more practical, something that's going to be more useful. But then again, it's nice to have Trikey to go uh, just up the road, um, which uh, which is always a good fun. Um, not on the pathways, as you can see here, um, of course, but always with a helmet for safety first. But going back to EV conversions for yourself, Paul, are there any EV conversions that you think are a good conversion to do or the best? What are the top top five conversions to do? do I think? mean, a lot of my knowledge is, of course, on the older stuff. You know, the easiest one I ever did was a rear engine Skoda. Yes. Like was, what Skoda was it? Was it a Skoda? It was, it was a one, rapid. it was a rapid 135i. So one of the very last cars that were fuel injected. I just remember, yes. And they, they did a coupe as well. Oh. Yeah, two, two door, the rapid is the two door coupe. That is, I mean, that is just super cool, isn't it? I mean, I mean given that mine was <laughs> burgundy, didn't have any Skoda badges on it, it kept getting mistaken for a Saab. Yeah, I bet. I remember I remember one going around in Bedford where I used to live, and it had the you know the rear slats at the back. What mm. are they called? I remember now. Louvers. Louvers. That just looked cool. But I mean that is a that is a super cool car. Very, very cool. I mean they, you know, they were one of the cheapest cars you could buy in the UK. Wow. And they tended to be bought by old people as their last car because they were cheap to finance. Sorry, I was saying look at that, and I was only looking at it by myself. I do apologise to everybody. <laughs> um, there it is. But, yeah, I mean, I, I had two rear-engine Skodas. One where I persuaded someone to buy one because they just needed four wheels and an engine to get them around. And I said, buy a Skoda because nobody else wants them. So I did a 150 yeah. quid car. And they had it for quite a while, and then they ran it out of oil. And I had the car off them for like 50 quid and slung another 50 quid engine in it. And I drove it for two years. And they, they were quiet. They were comfortable. The brakes were excellent. The handling, well, they didn't win their class on the RAC rally for about 15 years in a row for nothing. Oh, they did win it, did you say? Yeah, they won their class to the point where almost nobody else would enter the class. Oh, wow. So what makes this much easier to do an ev conversion than any other vehicle then well under the bonnet is an enormous amount of space that is basically one big empty luggage compartment right there is another compartment behind the rear seats and then the engine bay is cavernous they're actually kind of based on the renault dauphine um, which was another rear engine car and indeed there was a production version of the Dauphine called the Kenny Kilowatt. That is a cool looking car. Yeah, and a lot of those because I prefer my retro. This is a bit more rounded. Uh, it, but what if was I remember one? rightly, these cars had an external oil filler cap. What? So you didn't have to open the engine compartment to access the dipstick. Good. Does so the this problem mean... was that in America, where you had full service gas stations, mm -hmm. more than one car had its sump filled with fuel. Wow. Because there was <laughs> an external cap. So now we're talking. I mean, the fact that yeah, VR6. So yeah, I mean, there we go. I think I think that is a bit of a peach. I mean, I don't know where you'd bloody find one, but still. Um I mean, you know, if we're going to go down this ob obscure route, then I'd do it, a panache. It seems like we've gone that way, and it's all everyone's fault. 
I was trying to be practical and sensible with cars that you can purchase. But no, we're on cars that I've never even seen on the road. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, no, the, these are the cars that you can get passionate about and put in the effort that you'll want to put in the effort converting. Yeah. And some of these, you know, they're, they're like the day themes that I think there is pretty good um, um, support. Mm. I think you'd need it. Um, ironically, Doug has put a cabriolet is already heavy due to its chassis stiffness. Would converting one to an EV be a bad idea? Audi 80. The last car on my list was, in fact, an Audi 80. Now, hmm, Quattro. Well, I remember a conversation with Silent Classics at Fully Charged Live with a guy wanting to convert um, a Jaguar. And one of the questions he was asking was about uprating all the suspension for the increased weight. And I just chipped in, what increased weight? And nearly yeah. everything that electric classic cars are doing is coming out stock yeah. weight or lighter. I think even the their uh, their 260Z is lighter than stock. Yeah. Now, I didn't want to put it on the screen, but here we are. The Daihatsu Sirion Rally 4, because I know a friend, Zoe, she's converting. I think it's, I want to say, I always want to say it's a red one, but I think it's a silver one. Again, a rare car on British roads uh, for a number of reasons. Hello, the old uh, Boone X4. So now if we're going on to really weird cars, there's many Japanese cars that we could be looking at. But I think I think we've got to the point where we're looking at some really crazy cars. But, Paul, let's try and get back onto the straight and narrow on realistic EV conversions. <laughs> what do you reckon? I mean, in my mind, there's probably – the key five ones that have got EV conversion kits. You've got, you know, Fiat 500s, loads of kits for them. The Mini, the Defender, the Beetle, the Porsche. Those are, in my mind, are the five key ones. Can you think of any others that would be easier because there is a kit or they're easy just because they're not a difficult conversion? Um, I mean, I don't know much of the modern stuff. You know, my last encounter with working on a modern car was a 2008 Golf, and I never want to see one ever again. Well, that's because it was a turbo supercharged one, and we all know that you should it never was a, it, 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 even if it wasn't a turbo supercharged one, I'd still have all the having to buy, you know, 300 millimeter long special tools to access two of the sump bolts, but only if the flywheel was lined up correctly. Maybe that's why VW have done so well in their garage network by producing cars that no one can service but them. Um, so, yeah, with the EV uh, market of not really needing a service per se, but, you know, checks, obviously, for safety. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'm going to give one last one before we call it a day because we've gone well over time, which I knew what we would, Paul, because, you know, we love this subject, don't we? Um, is the fact that my... Uh, stepson joseph he's got a toyota yaris and it could be any yaris because i hear that there is a uh conversion well there is a plate that you could put onto the gearbox to put a hyper nine on but something like a yaris i mean they're so durable and any of the sort of toyota that type of thing but when i mentioned that putting a motor on the gearbox you were talking about the Maev. so what would be the easiest conversion on something like a Toyota Igo, a Toyota Yaris that, you know, there's loads about. You could probably pick up a really cheap one without an engine. What would be the best way to convert something like that? Yaris Verso. Oh, my God. No, don't go there. If don't go there. You haven't to... met people that own Yaris Versos. Trust me. I've met, all, I've met most of them working for Toyota. Sorry, Paul. Carry on. Well, if, if you're prepared to put in the effort learning how to make all the components work together, and the information is readily available. Mm. And something like the Mitsubishi Outlander rear motor and gearbox, which is effectively a front wheel drive setup. Um, and you know, I've I've done a number of custom builds over the years with cut and shut welded drive shafts. Um, okay. and that includes people using them for motorsport. Um, but it's yes, yeah, the Outlander PHEV. Um, 
yeah, there'll be people who've done the conversion already and there'll be stuff on the chargers and and all sorts. But um, and a, a well-made adapter plate is going to cost you more than the Mitsubishi motor and gearbox. Right. You know, they're fairly readily available for less than £500 delivered. Um, the um, inverter has been reverse engineered so you can control it over CAN. Okay. Um, you could run a Prius inverter for which there is a um, open inverter control board. The uh, PA, uh, the Outlander Charger, um, you know, the last one I bought, I think I paid £125 for. 3.3 yeah. kilowatt charger, which is also the DC to DC converter. And, you know, a lot of people, your, your second vehicle, your local run around, you don't need fast charging. No. All no. you're charging at home, so you don't need to worry about CHAdeMO or CCS. Don't you can always add it later. Yeah. As long as the voltage yeah. is, is compatible, you need in theory, CHAdeMO works down to 48 volt. The standard is written to work down to 48 volt. In reality, almost none of the chargers were ever built to work less than 200. Right. Um, this burned zero motorcycles. Their architecture is 144 volt. Mm -hmm. They tried to develop Chadamo fast charging and they bought a um, uh, a Sayer Brown Bavaria ABB. ABB. Um, yeah. I know it's a Sayer Brown Bavaria when they you actually used to use their name. Uh, charger, which is a fully compliant charger, and it will work on 48 volt batteries. Other chargers are available. Just um, I mean, <laughs> given that given the CCS cable is limited to 125 amps, that's only about seven and a half kilowatts at 48 volt. Right. At okay. which point you just buy a seven kilowatt onboard charger, so it's kind of pointless. Um, but they they bought these charger, did all their testing with it, started delivering bikes to customers. None of them would fast charge. Because the charges yeah. just they, they just didn't bother building them for anything less than 200 volt. Because who was building stuff that was less than 200 volt in production EVs? Yeah. Well, I, I would love to carry on this conversation. Maybe we could have another one. Um, maybe at your you know your place where we do another video, or you can, we could get you on for another chat because it's been a great session today. And thanks for everyone. Sorry, I haven't been able to answer all the questions there, but you know. We've had a great session today. Thank you, Paul, so much for all of your um, uh, time today. I really appreciate it. Anyone that wants to see me and meet other EV enthusiasts or charge heads, um, come see us at the Bedford uh, Caffeine and Machine Saturday morning, 10 to 1 p.m. It's £10 a ticket. You can get as many people in your car as possible. Um, I'm going to be down there, so I'll see you there. Um, and yeah, just please like, subscribe, like on the video, keep watching. Thank you for your support, everyone. And thanks for everyone who supported. Any any more words from you, Paul? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think run out for the moment. There we go. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Paul. And I'll see you next Thursday, eight o'clock. You and McTurk, all about batteries. See you then. <laughs>